Can you say amen? Amen. Oh, God is good. And all the time? And that is his nature. That's right. It's what they say in Kenya. And that is his nature. You know, I uh, bring you greetings from North Carolina, uh, where I reside with my tribe, my wife and four kids. So we are, uh, you know, five on five with one substitution in basketball. Or we can play five aside in soccer um, with an extra player. But um, they send their greetings, their prayers, and their love as well. Um, I haven't been in Dubai probably for, I want to say maybe five years. The last time I was here, I only had two kids. Uh, now I have four. And yes, I'm done having kids. <laughs> so I think if I want to keep my wife, I have to stop the the children. So I went to the doctor and asked them how to turn it off. So <laughs> they kept coming. So it is a pleasure to be with you all. Um, I am overjoyed because Dubai is, uh, it has a very special place in my heart. I've been here a few times, but Dubai is a unique place because it attracts people from all over the world. And because it attracts people from all over the world, the opportunity for the gospel to impact different countries can start taking place in, in a particular city like Dubai that is cosmopolitan. You have individuals from so many different countries and that if God provides quality, deep training for those individuals in this country who are often here, not because they've immigrated or married an Emirati, but because of a profession, because of a unique skill that they can offer the world, and if you can get individuals with the skills, the gifts, and the brightness of mind to embrace the mission of Christ, the possibilities are endless. Because you may not live in Dubai for the rest of your life, but the things that God is able to give you while you are here, you can bring those back to you wherever God takes you to the next place. Can you say amen? amen. And so for that reason, Dubai has definitely been a blessing to my life. Um, years ago, we were here volunteering with the Special Needs Orphanage and an Autism Center um, in Dubai, and that was a, it was a wonderful experience and opportunity to minister to some of the most needy individuals in this country. Uh, they require 24-hour surveillance uh, with severe cases of Down syndrome and um, autism and Asperger's disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that was a blessing. Now, to get a little bit more to our theme, and I'm going to make sure I put my, my timer on. Um, the concept of standing up and standing out. It is actually something that I am very glad that you chose this theme. And the reason I'm, I'm glad about that is because the concept of standing is something that's not actually very common among Christians living in a country that doesn't necessarily subscribe to their worldview. To be in a place like Dubai or the Middle East is a little bit easier than other places in the Middle East, but nevertheless, it has its challenges. And that's from my several trips to Dubai, I learned very, very quickly how difficult it was for individuals to, con to truly be able to stand for what they believe at all times. And oftentimes, that was driven by a fear that the reasons that brought them to Dubai might be submitted as a cost for standing up for Christ. And so many individuals will accommodate their religion to their lifestyle rather than accommodating their lifestyle to their religion. And because of this, Dubai presents a lot of attractions. It presents a lot of things that can bring us to a place where we say, well, that's okay, and we start compromising on things that in our home countries we would have never even considered. And that's why choosing a theme to stand up, because having been a soldier myself as a former Marine, and we're going to get to that message later in the week, like a good soldier, the concept of standing is critical to having peace in life. You will not be able to sleep if you do not stand for what you believe to be right. You will not be able to truly enter into a deep human relationship, whether marriage or friendship or church community, if you cannot truly stand up for what you know and believe to be true. But on top of that, to be able to stand out 
is a natural result of standing up for something. Even if you are the only one. But you see, that's a scary thing. And I know that's a scary thing, and I'll share part of that over the course of this week in my own experience. But I want to encourage us as we begin this journey together of standing, that you would come to God on this opening night with an understanding that you did not come here just to say you attended another event. But that you realize there are some areas in your life that you are not standing up for Jesus. There are some parts of your experience and your spiritual journey that you're not standing up for the truth. And in that particular frame of mind, what becomes radical? What becomes influential? What becomes changing to all those around us is when we come to that place where we're willing to never cross the line for Christ. To let people know you cannot be bought or sold. That you will do what is right because it is right. And you will leave the consequences in the hands of God. Because you know what your reward will be in heaven. You think Dubai is a special place? You haven't been to the New Jerusalem. You haven't been in the presence of an almighty God who will know you by name and know every sacrifice you made for the sake of his glory. That's where, by God's grace, we intend to journey this week. So would you pray with me as we begin? Mighty God, everlasting Father, what a joy it is to be in your presence with your children. Lord, as you've brought us here safely at the very inauguration of this particular event, we need something unique that we've never experienced before. We want to be able to not only be challenged and to be inspired and to be able to muster up the courage to follow Jesus no matter what the cost, but also, Lord, we want to be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. Lord, we want to see how blessed those are who trust in you. And so we pray that as we begin this message, may the sweet, sweet spirit of Jesus rest upon this place. Lord, may he move from heart to heart and from mind to mind, impressing the truth upon the soul. May you use this man who is but dust in your sight. This is our prayer. And we trust that you will help this to be our experience as we offer this prayer from our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, I hope you brought them because we're going to use them. It is a youth conference, and it is designed to guide us deeper into a relationship with Christ. So please take out your Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon, it is the la one of the last letters of Paul right before the book of Hebrews, the book of Philemon. Philemon. Now, Philemon only has one chapter, so there are no other chapters to turn to, so we just say Philemon verse 1 or verse 2. Philemon, when you're there, you can say amen. Okay, Philemon. Now, we're going to take a unique journey on the background of this book because this seems like one of those books that when you're doing your Bible reading plan in a year, it's great when it says, oh, read the book of Philemon today. You say, oh, awesome, you know, just 25 verses and I'm done for today. The whole book, I read a whole book of the Bible today. You can be proud of yourself, but the book of Philemon is a very powerful book. And I hope by the time we finish studying that book today, you will see that. And you'll be inspired to go back and look at this thing a little bit deeper. Now, in the book of Philemon, we're going to go through the entire book. Now, that's not saying much, but by the time we dig into the details, you're going to see and understand a very unique and powerful truth rooted in the experience of Paul 
Onesimus, and Philemon. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, and to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you're studying the letters of Paul, it is important to always understand the context. To understand the what? The context, which means who is writing the letter, to whom is the letter written, and what is the situation that brought the letter about. So in verse 1, we know that who is writing the letter according to verse 1. What does your Bible say? It says Paul. So we know that it's Paul, but he doesn't identify himself as an apostle this time. He says Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. So this is Paul and Timothy, and then it says to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. So Paul is writing a letter to Philemon, but then he adds the beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the whole church in Philemon's house. So apparently Philemon is a very influential Christian. So influential that he has a church meeting inside of his house. So we also know that Philemon is not a poor individual. Philemon has enough space for worshipers to gather in his house safely in a time in Rome where Christians are being pursued. Being viewed as individuals who are bringing sedition to the community of Rome. They're not necessarily trusted, but they haven't decided to fully get rid of them. Now, at this point in time, Paul, when writing this letter to Philemon, but apparently he wants other people to be aware of the occasion of his letter. Now, verse 4, he says, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. Now, I want you to notice something that the Bible says Paul is making mention not of the whole church, but he's talking to Philemon. So he says, I make mention of you how often? What does the Bible say? Always in my prayers. Now I want you to think about someone that you pray for every single day. I want you to think about someone that you always like to mention in your prayers. Doesn't necessarily have to be a focused prayer or they're always on your prayer list, but there's someone in your life, whether it's your mom, your dad, your grandmother, your younger brother or sister, whatever it is, your spouse, your kids, think about someone that you always mention to God in prayer each and every day. When you go to God, you're always thinking, yes, Lord, I have my requests, but there's this other individual. There's these other people that are on my heart. And Philemon was one of those people to the Apostle Paul. We get an insight into Paul's prayer life. That yes, Paul has all the churches to bear, but sometimes Paul is remembering specific individuals. And one of those individuals was Philemon. He goes on to say, Hearing of your love and faith, in verse 5, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward how many of the saints? All of the saints. So he says, Paul says, I'm a prisoner in Rome. And all the way in Rome, I have heard of your love and of your faith toward Jesus as well as toward all the other saints around. So apparently, Philemon is one of those Christians that the, 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 the message and the rumors of his spirituality and of his walk with God has traveled beyond his own city. This is not something that was just, oh, in his own house, people respected him in that church. This was being carried from Christian to Christian to Christian all the way to Paul while he was a slave in Rome. Now, if, you, if I asked you guys in Dubai Central Church or the different churches around Dubai, who is the most loving Christian? Is there someone that everybody at any church in Dubai knows about this person? Hearing, doesn't see, hasn't experienced it, but just heard of their love and of the faith that they have toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you have a Philemon. And in this individual, Paul says, I'm praying for him every day. 
I'm always making mention of him in my prayers. I've heard of his love and of his faith towards Jesus. But not only is he just a deeply spiritual man, he is an individual who's shown it to how many of the saints? All of them. It didn't matter to Philemon if you were poor. It didn't matter if you were a new believer or if you were an unbeliever visiting. It didn't matter if you were an experienced believer who had been around for 25 years. Philemon treated you with the same love and faith. Can you say amen? amen. I want to be a Christian like Philemon. Amen. I want to be a Christian that it doesn't matter at what stage in the Christian life you are. I'm going to show you the same love and Christ-like spirit to you. And not only am I doing that, I'm not doing that so much to be heard, but I'm doing it because that's just who I am. Philemon wasn't doing it for recognition. He was doing because that's who he sincerely was. Verse 6, he says that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm praying that as you share your faith, it will become effective. Because I've heard of your love, I've heard of your faith, now I'm praying that God would give you success and lead souls to you. So now you think about somebody who inspires you with their walk with God. Someone who's active in evangelism. Someone who's trying to find ways to sow the seeds of the gospel and of the kingdom of God. Don't you want to pray for that person to have success? Aren't you praying that, man, that guy, man, I hope that he is able to connect with this person because he's such a sincere follower and disciple of Jesus, what a great person to be converted from. Because guess what? You don't want to be brought into a church by a half-hearted Christian. Because you're not getting the full gospel. You're getting a half gospel. You're getting gospel light. If you do that, say, man, I, this is the person who brought me. This is all I knew. Kind of like Apollos and his disciples. They knew the, the baptism of John, but they never even heard of the such a thing as the Holy Spirit. So what were they baptized into was Paul's question. Because they did not get a full concept of the gospel. So here's Philemon. Paul is praying for him. Notice what he says in verse 7. He says, for we, that's Paul and Timothy, we have how much, what type of joy do they have? They have great joy and consolation. That means comfort in your what? In your love. We find great joy and great comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. What's that last word? Brother. Listen, when somebody, we use the word brother and sister so loosely in the church. It's like a military term. You know, when you walk around the military, say, oh, you know, good morning, corporal, good morning, sergeant. It's just a title. That's how we talk to each other in the church. Brother, sister, brother Sebastian, sister such and such will join us. But do you really see the person as your sister? Paul doesn't use that word just because it was the regular nomenclature that you gave to a fellow believer. He called Archippus a fellow soldier. He didn't call him a brother. But he called Philemon a brother. A brother who he finds great joy and comfort in his love. Now, I want you to imagine if you got a letter from a man or a woman whom God had used very powerfully in your life that started this way. This is the beginning of the letter. I'm praying for you. I'm making mention of you always in my prayers. I'm praying that you sharing your faith is effective. My heart is comforted, and I have great joy over your love. You're like, wow, man, this must just be a letter of encouragement. What a great letter to receive from Paul, right? You're thinking, man, from Paul, he's a prisoner. Maybe he's going to tell me how he's doing in Rome. And then he says, verse 8, therefore. You know, whenever you're studying the Bible, we always say when you see the word therefore, you should ask yourself, what is it there for? Meaning that everything before this word is leading to the statement I'm about to make. The fact that I wrote to you, the fact that I'm telling you how much I appreciate your Christian walk, I've heard of your love, I've heard of your faith. He says, therefore, this is the conclusion because of the love you have toward all the saints. Everybody's heard of your love. Everybody has been refreshed by you, brother. And notice what happens next. 
He says, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to commend you to do what? To commend you. That's a transition in the letter, right? So if you wrote, you got a letter from somebody that inspired you and loved and respected and said, oh, this is how I feel about you. Then they say, paragraph three, therefore, though I might be so bold to commend you. Oh, okay. This, this letter has taken a different tone. This is not a how are you doing, here's an update kind of letter. So someone wrote to you in an email, hey, I might, be, I might actually just command you to do it, but, you know, instead of commanding you, this is what he says. He says, what is fitting or what is appropriate? He says in verse 9, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ. He says in verse 10, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Now for you and I reading this verse in the Bible, we're looking at it and we're saying, Onesimus, who in the world is Onesimus? And why is Paul writing to Philemon about a person named Onesimus? Why is he appealing to him about Onesimus? And what does he mean I could just be so bold in Christ that I could command you instead of I'm actually going to ask you. I'm going to appeal to you. And he says, for love's sake. Because, you know, if you're doing something simply because it is a command, it's not out of love. That's one of the most powerful insights into the Christian experience. If you and I are doing things just because God commanded it to be so, we're not doing it out of love. We're not obeying God because we love him. We're obeying because we don't want the consequence. And many of us grow up in very heavy authoritarian cultures. Someone's older than you, you have to listen. Right or wrong doesn't matter. But you see, in those cultures, sometimes the commands of those above you do not agree with the commands of God. And when they do not agree with the commands of God, he says, you have to love me more than your father and mother. More than your brother, than your sister, houses or lands, your wife, or even your husband. Or even your master, your boss, your employer. You have to love me more. Because you cannot serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will you say, well, I'll go with this one. But you can't obey both. This is one of the reasons that when I was United States Marine, and I was introduced to Christ... Here I was, I was trained to kill. So I'm thinking, okay, this is my life. This is what I'm planning to do. And I was in before September 11th happened. And I thought, man, you know, this is boring. I learned all this combat, martial arts, all this stuff, just to sit in a room, checking on a computer, doing laps, five-mile runs every other day. For what reason? Then I saw 9-11. And I said, okay, it's time to go. All this stuff that they invested in me and taught me how to do, it's time for me to put it to use. And right around that time, it's like God knew what was coming. He said, Sebastian, you think you're going to go over to Afghanistan and all these places and you're ready to go? See, God was protecting me from myself because I for sure would have gone and killed people without hesitation. I wasn't a Christian and I was trained to do it, to do it well. So I thought to myself, it's time to go. And right around that time is when there I was watching 9-11 happen on the TV screen. It was literally a month before this, I was introduced to the girl who would eventually give me a Bible study on Daniel chapter 2. Right before this. So I had met her and I thought, well, we're probably going to go in a couple months. And during that waiting period, she and I sat down. She gave me a Bible study. On Daniel chapter 2. Now, in, 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 in the reason why I bring this up is because when you're looking at Philemon's situation and Onesimus and how he could have approached him, he says, I'm just going to appeal to you. When you sent me to Afghanistan and say, Sebastian, this is your mission, I wasn't going to be killing those people because I was following a command. I would have been killing them because I enjoyed to do well what I was called to do. I sincerely loved it. I was a sniper. I was trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so I was like, I'm ready. And I love doing it. Because when you don't have God in your heart, you have no regard for human life. 
So for me, I'm like, listen, you don't have green and black on, you are the enemy. And if you don't obey my commands immediately, I'm going to take you down. Or what we say in the military is, I will put you down. And in that experience, when Jesus came into my heart, it was a different story. I wasn't not wanting to kill people because it was a command. It was because I love God. No one told me, Sebastian, you need to jump out of the hip-hop culture that you were embedded in. No one asked me to do that. I didn't go to any seminars on music. I didn't get any Bible studies about proper worship styles. That's not what happened. It was simply a desire to know Christ. And in my pursuit of Christ and in falling in love with Christ, no one had to tell me, Sebastian, you can't be going to the club. Sebastian, you can't be watching horror movies. People are possessed. What are you doing? So I'm sitting in my room, and each night I'm studying the word of God. I'm seeking Jesus, and somehow my heart begins to start burning and saying, man, I cannot continue to do this and be a Christian. And therefore, I come to the fork in the road. Which one? You see, it made so much sense at that point in my life why all the people who tried to witness to me as an atheist in college were not effective because a 50% Christian will never win 100% atheist. A half-hearted Christian will never win 100% Muslim. How can you win me to a religion you are less dedicated to than I am to a false religion? It's not possible. You got to be a 100 percenter. And 100 percent doesn't come from just doing what is required. 100 percent comes from love. Because you will do even more than what is asked. Now we got to break down who Onesimus is, because I only have a few more minutes left. The Bible says that Paul is appealing in verse 10 for Onesimus, and notice what he says in verse 10. He says, for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my chains. Now I want you to notice, Paul says he was in prison in his chains. In his bondage in Rome, he met Onesimus, and he had begotten him. Now, obviously, he doesn't mean begotten as in birth, because obviously, Onesimus is a grown man. So in, in this moment, when he says, I begotten him in my chains, Paul didn't have a wife, Paul didn't have a baby, but it's using spiritual language that he led, to Onis he led Onesimus to Christ. So while Paul is in prison, somehow Onesimus met Paul in Rome while Paul was in prison, and Paul had delivered the gospel and the man surrendered his heart to Jesus. Then he says in verse 11, who once was unprofitable to who? To you. Which means that Onesimus and Philemon had a prior relationship before he met Paul in Rome. So now in this relationship that they had, he says he was unprofitable. And it's funny because... The name Onesimus actually means profitable. That's what the name means. So in the English, you don't catch it. But in the Greek, what he's saying is there was a time when to you he wasn't Onesimus. But now that he's met Jesus, he's actually Onesimus. He's the real who he is. He wasn't himself back when he was with you. And in this moment of time, Paul says, but now he's profitable to you and to me. Verse 12, we get a shocker. This is a bomb, earth-shattering statement, Paul says. In verse 12, he says, I am sending him back. And that word, that phrase in Greek is, I'm sending him in person. Now, you need to know that Onesimus, coming from Rome, he was almost 400 and something miles away from where Philemon was. So that means when Paul wrote this letter, he gave it to Timothy Timothy gives it to Onesimus, and Onesimus jumps on the next boat over to go back to Philemon, where Philemon once owned Onesimus as a slave. Now, this is very interesting because in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 15, you don't have to turn there, but you can put it in your notes. The Bible says that if a slave runs away, right, and you find him, you actually don't have to send him back to his master. 
He's content to stay with you, but you just can't oppress him, God says. So you can't use that against him. So it's interesting that in the Old Testament laws, if a slave ran away, you don't have to send him back. Now, Roman law, you definitely did. It's like a slave was someone else's property. It's like, I found your wallet in my house. Well, it doesn't make it your wallet. It just makes my wallet in your house. Amen? So in this moment, Paul says, Onesimus, this is what I'm going to do. I'm writing this letter to Philemon. I'm going to give you the letter, and I want you to carry it to Philemon yourself. So now here is Onesimus going back to the man that he just left. And notice what he says in verse 12. I'm sending him back. You therefore receive him. That is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my change for the gospel. Verse 14. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps, verse 15, he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave. So there we see the clue. Before Onesimus was a slave, but he says, now I'm sending him back to you, and I don't want you to receive him as a slave, but he says what? But more than a slave, a beloved what? Brother. Back when he was a slave in your house, Philemon, he didn't know Jesus. He was just a slave. And apparently, Onesimus had decided to leave Philemon's home. But we're going to get to a little bit more detail before we bring this all together. He says, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Verse 17, if then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. Think about what the man is saying. I want you to receive your former slave as you are receiving the man who led you to Christ. I want you to receive him as if it was Paul coming to visit your house. It's like, wait a minute, this is crazy. But then he goes forward and he says in verse 18, but if he has wronged you, which he has, because as a property, he cannot leave when he feels like it. There was a process called manumission by which in ancient Rome, you would buy your freedom. You had to earn it. And you had to go to the, the office and say, look, I paid it off. I paid all my debt. And then as one last act, the master would just hit you upside the head as his last act as your master. This was an actual practice in Rome. So in, in this time, he could have done it that way, but Onesimus wasn't going through the process. Onesimus decided, I'm going to leave right now. Because slavery at that time is not the slavery we remember in Britain or in American slavery. It's not that type of slavery. As a slave, you were intelligent. You had gifts. You had knowledge, and therefore you had responsibilities like Joseph was a slave in Potiphar's house. He was a slave, but he was overseeing all his goods. He could have easily robbed him. So in the same sense, Onesimus, Paul says, if he has wronged you or he owes you anything, put that on whose account? He says, put it on my account. In other words, Paul has a tab because notice the next statement. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay. Not to mention, you know, now Paul's throwing a little shade. That's what we call it now. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord Notice verse 21, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than what I say. <laughs> but meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. So let's put this all together. Onesimus robs Philemon as a slave, and goes to Rome, hundreds of miles away, thinking he's free forever. He thought he was free until he met the Apostle Paul. When he met the Apostle Paul, then he understood this whole time that I ran and I was trying to break free from the slavery to Philemon, there was really someone else that you were a slave to. You were a slave to Satan. You were a slave to guilt because now that you're a runaway slave, you can't live a public life. You're ducking and dodging. You're hiding in dark corners. You're trying to find ways in order to survive. And maybe the only people 
that were willing to serve Onesimus were Christians. People who were already on the run, already hiding in Rome, already willing to support you. And he says, but I'm not a believer like you, but that's okay. Because this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We love those who are unlovable. We forgive those who are unforgivable. We serve those who are unservable. And so through that provision, somehow he came across the path of the Apostle Paul. And as Paul preached the good news to his soul, the man fell down and gave his life to Jesus. And in that moment of time, Onesimus said, Paul, I'm ready to serve you. I'm ready to do whatever you need while you're locked up. Here you are as the man of God, an apostle sent by God to the Gentiles, locked up in a prison in Rome. Whatever I can do to stretch your hands, let me do. And Paul says, Onesimus, there's one thing. You said that you were once a slave to a man named Philemon. I know him. I also led him to Christ. And you cannot move forward, Philemon, until you deal with your past. I'm sorry, Onesimus. Until you deal with this past. So Paul began to write a letter, and he gave him that letter. And he says, I want you to go back to Philemon. And Onesimus looked at the Apostle Paul and said, but Paul, you don't understand. If I go back to Philemon, at best I could be punished and reinstated into my servitude, and I can't come back to Rome. At worst, I could be killed for fleeing as a slave. Paul says, don't worry. Just bring the letter. Give this letter to Philemon. So you can imagine on one sunny day in Asia Minor, Philemon was out in the yard and he sees Onesimus walking up his driveway. Probably in utter shock. A slave who runs away, robs you, and willingly comes back. And when he returns, he says, I got nothing to say. The only thing I have is a letter from Paul. And Paul is writing this letter, and Onesimus is standing in the presence of Philemon while he's reading the letter. So you can imagine he's looking at the letter, and Paul says, receive him as myself. And he's looking at Onesimus right there in front of him. And in this very moment, Onesimus is at the mercy of Philemon and his willingness to accept the intercession of the apostle Paul. Immediately, we realize in that moment, he had no other argument except the letter that he had from Paul. He had no other plea except the words that the apostle had written to Philemon. Because you see, right then and there, we now see the gospel. We now understand that we all have a past. We have Philemon's that we have wronged. We have Philemon's that we have hurt. We have Philemon's that we need to go back to, and the number one Philemon in our lives is God. Because by creation, we were designed to be his servants. But you and I grew up serving ourselves rather than serving God. We became slaves and servants to someone else rather than our rightful master. And somewhere along the path and the journey, we met Jesus. And when we found Christ and Christ was able to break our hearts, to lead us to conversion, to take out the stony heart and to give us a heart of flesh, Jesus then says, you need to go back to the Father. And as you make that journey back to God, knowing all the years that you've robbed God of in your service, all the times you used the body that he made for your own selfish purposes, All the times that you sat down and popped open pornography to use the eyes and the vision that God blessed you with to watch. All the times that you used your hands to take what was not rightfully yours in order to serve your own selfish desires. And yet they belong to God. The very breath of life that you breathed was in his hands. And yet God allowed you, unlike Philemon, he couldn't track you down, but see, Jesus can track you down. God knew exactly where you were. God knew exactly what you were doing when you were not in his service. But yet and still, when you and I go back to God, 
and we bring this letter from Jesus, which this letter of Philemon is a symbol of what the blood of Jesus pleads for you and me before the throne of God. So that when we go back to God, you say, God, I don't have an argument. I cannot justify my behavior. I cannot justify what I have done. You might have sinned this morning. You might have sinned this week. You might have an evil in your life that you're already accustomed to doing. A terrible, dark habit that is hard for you to break. And it causes you, like Philemon, to hide in the Roman corners of guilt and of shame. To make sure you put on your Adventist faith on Sabbath and make sure on Monday you struggle in secret and in silence. But see, God knows. And so tonight you cannot hide before him whose eyes penetrate even the dark corners of your soul. We cannot pretend before God. We cannot put on a facade. We cannot just impersonate a Christian or a child of God. I know my son. And if someone tried to pretend to be my son, I will identify him very quickly. And please believe God, he knows his child. He knows if you're really a child of God and if you're trying to impersonate, he will spot a fake in a second. God doesn't let counterfeit children into the kingdom of God. We have to be a true child of God born again. But how are we born again? By the blood of Jesus. So that when you and I go to God and we are standing before God, you have an argument just like Onesimus. So can you imagine that when you and I bow before God and there we are standing before him and all of our sins and all of our evil and all of our wickedness and all of our selfishness and right then and there all we can say is I have the blood of Jesus. And that blood tells God exactly what Paul is telling Philemon. He says, God, Father, I'm appealing to you for my son, Sebastian. And as I appeal to you, I want you to receive him as if you were receiving me. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Jesus pleads to God that God would receive you as if you were Jesus himself. And he says, if Sebastian has wronged you, if he owes you anything, put it on my account. I'll take that two amens. He says, put it on my account. I'll repay you. And he says, you know what? He said, Father, I'm so confident in your obedience because of my sacrifice on the cross of Jesus. I'm confident you'll do even more than what I ask. Listen, when you read Desire of Ages, and it talks about when Jesus went back to the Father, quoting from Psalm 24, it says that as Jesus was journeying through space and he was approaching the heavenly gates, it said, lift up, O ye gates, be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And she says, the angels at the gates of heaven said, who is this King of glory? She says they didn't ask the question because they didn't know. They asked the question because they just wanted to hear his name. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Amen. Lift up, O ye gates. Be you lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. And Jesus says, I want you to receive Sebastian just as you receive me. When Jesus touched feet down in glory, there was an open path between him and the Father. Every angel moved out the way because they knew there was a serious reunion in place. Jesus, for 33 years, had been separated from his father, walking on the very dirt of this earth. And now he was coming back, having been born of Mary, not in the form that he left, but with the wounds in his hands, with the wounds in his side, saying, I don't got time for the worship of angels. I don't got time for the adoration of the limitless creation that I made. I don't have time for that. I'm simply coming to bring my blood to you. Why? Because of Sebastian. You say, well, why is it that Onesimus was able to stand before Philemon because he had already 
stood before God and was justified. Amen. You see, the reason why we don't stand up, we don't stand out, is because we're burdened with guilt. It's because we're deep down in our hearts, we don't believe that we are right with God. So many of us are haunted by our past. The mistakes that we have made. The sins that we've committed. The evil that we have done. But yet when you are standing before God and he looks at you and says, I find no fault. I find no fault. I can't see anything wrong with you. I want you to think about that in your mind. Right now at this moment, through the blood of Jesus, if you accept that blood and the sacrifice on your behalf, God looks at you right now and says, I can't see anything wrong with you. But yet all we do is stand in the mirror and point out everything wrong with ourselves. Going to a congregation scared to be gossiped about. Thinking people are going to look at us. Oh, that brother, oh, that sister is this. Oh, that worrying about whether people are going to judge us or not. It is easy to stand before men when you've already stood before God. Amen. That's why he can make the journey back. Nisimus wasn't trembling. I'm sure his heart was racing. I'm sure he was concerned what God was going to allow to happen in his providence. I'm sure he was thinking in his mind of all the possibilities. But why was Onesimus there in the first place? Because he had already stood before God. Paul had preached a good gospel to him. He knew where he stood before his maker. And he had resolved in his heart that even if Philemon will not forgive me and bring me back as a slave, I'm still going. I'm not afraid to stand before Philemon. Because I've already stood before God. And I know that one day he's going to bring forth my righteousness as the light and my justice as the noonday. I know that there's going to come a time where I'm going to stand on Mount Zion. And that righteousness of Christ is going to cover me and roll down like a mighty stream. I'm confident in that. And because I'm confident in that, I can face this man. So what about you? What about you? Can you stand up and stand out before any man or woman? Who are you afraid to face? What are you afraid to suffer? Then you know who your Philemon is. Then you know. You know my time is out. But I just want to end with these words. There was a time where I understood in a personal way, reading these words, I was sitting inside of a jail. I was talking to people that I had wronged and facing them. Thinking before that conversation, what am I going to say to this person? See, back when I was an atheist, you know, I could look at the situation and say, hey, you know what? Everybody makes mistakes. That's what we say, right? We all fall short. And that just, just covers it, right? Makes everybody feel better who we hurt. No, it doesn't. Because as my heart was changed, from the men that I was that hurt those people. Now looking at them, I was ashamed that I could even commit those things. 
It was like it was a different person. I wasn't myself. And it's hard for the other person to accept that you have changed. Because the only memory they had of me, the last memory they had of me, is of me abusing them, beating them, violating them, disrespecting them. They say, that's the last time I saw your face. And now you were Christian. And there I was sitting down waiting to see them. See, the difference is they're not God. You hand them this letter, they probably wrinkle it up and throw it in the trash. Sebastian, you deserve every ounce of pain that's coming to you. And I had to look at the person and say, you're right. I do. I deserve every ounce. Doesn't matter how long. I'm incarcerated. It doesn't matter what I go through. It's never going to take away your pain. Because sometimes you and I are not Onesimus in the story. We're Philemon. We don't get the end of the story. We just get the letter. We don't know what Philemon did. As if God is leaving it open to us to decide in our lives. Sometimes there's an Onesimus that wronged us. And God is coming to us tonight. And He's saying, I need you to receive them as my own heart. To reject them is to reject the heart of Jesus. So as I picked up that receiver phone, person picked up the phone on the other side and they said, you know, Sebastian, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this, made me feel like this, still affects my life to this day. What can I say? And the hardest question is when people come and they say, why did you do it? Why? I don't have an answer except for the fact that I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. My heart is desperately wicked. And without Jesus, I'd still be doing it. In order to stand up and to stand out, we have to start by standing before God knowing where we stand before him that causes mountains to tremble in his presence. Amen. And to know that God looks at you tonight and says, everything is right between us. I have no problem. Not because you're good, not because you're righteous, but because of what Jesus has done. Amen. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Thank you for the extra time. Father in heaven, Lord, we're thankful tonight for your word. Thankful, Father, for the experience of Onesimus. And so tonight, Lord, while we focus and turn our eyes to standing up for Jesus,
for truth and standing out. Lord, we have to first learn to stand before God. And so maybe there's someone here tonight that is haunted by their past. And tonight, you are ready for Jesus to deliver you from the evil in your past. And you say, Lord, I want to be free from the guilt, from the shame, from the fact that my past mistakes and the things that I've suffered continue to haunt me. I want to be free from that. I want to invite you to come here to this altar for special prayer. Say, Lord, I want to be free. It only starts with one person who is ever going to be that courageous soul that says, I'm willing to come, come, because I'm going to pray with you tonight, because I know what it's like to have a dark past. You say, Lord, I want to be free from that. Come. It always starts with just one. And once somebody has the courage to say, yes, I'm not ashamed to confront the fact that I've done things and been through things that I'm ashamed of and I'm haunted by that guilt. But tonight, as you come to this altar, God is receiving you as the heart of Jesus. He's receiving you as Jesus himself because of what Christ has done. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If you're not coming, you need to be praying that somebody has the courage to come. You say, Lord, I am wanting you to deliver me from those things. You can make your way over here. We've got plenty of space. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. We're still praying. This is only for those who are coming. Because this is what we like to do. We like to look around and see who's coming. It's not about your neighbor. It's about you. Say, Lord, I want to be delivered from these things in my past. You can come here in front of the pulpit. It's okay. We've got plenty of space. Anyone else before we pray? I'm not going to hold this much longer. But I just have to ask. Because I know what it's like to have a past. To be haunted by it. But there's nothing more refreshing than when God wipes it all away. Sin had left a crimson stain. Jesus washed it all away. Anyone else before we pray? Say, Lord, I want you to deliver me from my past whether it's pain that you've suffered or pain that you've caused, Jesus can do that tonight. You can stand before God and be confident that Jesus loves you, that God wants to use you, and that God, he has a plan and a future and a hope. He doesn't see you as leftovers or as broken. He only sees is what the potential he can accomplish through your complete surrender to him. Anyone else, before we pray, come now. You say, Lord, deliver me from these things in my past. Father in heaven, Lord, we are standing here at this altar because we are not perfect. Lord, we came, we've come to you because We've done some shameful things and we've suffered shameful things. But it didn't matter how much evil and abuse that they heaped upon Jesus. It did not change his value in your eyes. It, didn't, it doesn't matter, Lord, how much wicked and evil the thief on the cross had committed that he was in the middle of being executed for his crimes. You were still able to give him the assurance that he would be in paradise. 
Lord, in his dying breaths, he was able to lay hold of the blood of Jesus Amen. that was bleeding right before his very eyes. Because we serve a God that delights in mercy, a God who says he's willing to take our sins and put them in the depths of the sea. And so, Lord, as we stand here before you, our goal is to be like Onesimus, to be delivered from the fear of our past, to be delivered from the pain of our past, the mistakes that we've made, and to be able to stand up before any man or woman because we have stood before God and we've been accepted. And so tonight, Lord, may each soul at this altar know in their heart of hearts that the God of heaven, the Lord of hosts, the almighty God, the eternal father, looks at them and says, neither do I condemn you. That they are clean before his eyes. That one day your heart will be filled with joy in singing over them that they will see you face to face because they shall be pure in heart. And Lord, that the blood of Jesus has made them clean, has washed them whiter than snow. Lord, no matter the stain, no matter how dark it was, may you show the light of what Christ has brought on their behalf. Now, Father, as we leave this place, send us with courage. Send us with conviction that no matter the mistakes of yesterday, today is a new day. Amen. That we are clean, that we are washed, that we are pleasing in your sight, that you love us, with an everlasting love. And Lord, you have nothing but joy when you see us. You've received us as Jesus himself. And we are precious in your eyes. We love you and thank you for these gifts. And we offer this prayer from our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.